Well, we're glad that you're here this morning, and uh, what a great time of, of worship we've had, and, uh, and we're glad that you kind of uh, braved the rain this morning. And for those of you that are worshiping with us online, we are uh, delighted to have you with us um, here this morning uh, as well. If you're a guest here, we're so glad you're here, and uh, we want you to, uh, to make yourself at home. There's a little card there in the pew rack in front of you. You can find a little QR code there, take you to our website, and you can find out about us, and we'd love to know a little bit more about you, and we want you to just uh, make yourself at home uh, today. Uh, we are in the midst, have just started a series of messages uh, on uh, some of the Psalms. And today, we're going to, to look at Psalm, uh, the third Psalm. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there. But uh, I, I'm confident of this, that I'm going to tell you what you're going to hear today. You've never seen it from this perspective. Now, there may be one or two that have, but not many. And because um, I had, it was brand, it was brand new to me. You know, one of the things that's true here, whoever you are, if this is your first time or your 500th time or whatever, there are certain things that are true. There are some people here today that, you know, at some time in your life, you've been through some difficult times. It's been really hard. And when you said, you know, at, at that moment, it, it can't get any worse. And, but you've come out of that. And there are some that that's where you are right now. Right now you're there. It can't get any worse. And by the way, if you've been able to dodge it up until now... If you've not had that in the past and you're not in the present, then I can tell you with great certainty there are going to be those times that come in the future. And, uh, and I'll tell you, one of the things that can help you is the third psalm uh, in looking at that. Now, to do that, I need to give you a little historical background here today. The third psalm was written by David. It was the, obviously the first psalm in psalms that he had written. And David was, as you know, uh, or many of you know, the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. David was the, probably the best known of any of the patriarchs. The king, the, the one who uh, slayed Goliath. I mean, everybody in the world knows about David. And what a godly man he was. But David went through a lot. Let me give you a little background. When David became king at uh, Hebron, he took over, and the, and the people, they, they followed him everywhere. And by the way, you can see all this somewhere around uh, 2 Samuel, maybe chapter 11 through chapter 18 or 19 of what I'm going to say to you today. But just give you a little synopsis because I want you to see it. Uh, real clearly. And one of, the, one of the first things we find about David is his affair with Bathsheba. He saw this beautiful woman. He wanted her. He took her for his own. And after he had done that, after he'd had the affair with Bathsheba, he had to do something about her husband. He served in the military. So David had him put in the front, front lines and, in a sense, had him executed. He killed him. And David was confronted about that. And, of course, when Bathsheba did that and Bathsheba ended up being pregnant, he couldn't hide it. And they, they opened him up. And, boy, at that moment, David, the king, lost his reputation. And David must have thought, hey, I was the king and greatly beloved, and now people make fun of me. It can't get any worse. But David thinks he's going to survive that. And then when Bathsheba has the baby, they lose the child. The baby dies. And David says, it can't get any worse. So he goes on and he keeps ruling, tries to rebuild. He has a, a son, Amnon. Amnon is his oldest son. And David had other children. In fact, he had 
two others that are mentioned there, Absalom and Tamar. And they were by uh, uh, another mother. And Tamar was very beautiful. And Amnon, who was his oldest son, fell in love with his half-sister Tamar. And he wanted her so badly. And he couldn't figure out how to do it. And so he went to the king. He said, King, I'm sick. I'm sick, and boy, I need somebody to nurse me. Would you have Tamar come and fix me something and, and come to my house and help me? And the king, David himself, said, sure I will. And so he tells Tamar, I want you to go over to Amon's house, Amnon's house, and help him. And so she goes over there. And he has his opportunity. He takes advantage of her. He assaults her. And after that, he, this woman that he loved, and she was drop-dead gorgeous, okay? Because her brother, the Bible says that Absalom was, there wasn't anybody more handsome than Absalom. So after this, Amnon hated her. He hated her, and she was disgraced. The Bible says that her life, she became desolate, that everyone knew this had happened. And Absalom, her brother, went to her and said, what's wrong with you? And she told him. And Absalom, he hated Amnon. And he started to plot. Probably worked on it for a couple of years and how he was, was going to kill Amnon. And so it's a couple of years now. And, and Ab Absalom comes to the king and says, I'm going to have a party out at, uh, maybe it's at Summer House. And I want to invite all the the king's sons, and he had a number of them. And so I want them to come out there. And he did all of that just so he could get Amnon out of the city. And he had him out there at the party, and he looked at his servants, and he said, kill him, and that's exactly what they did. And Absalom had his brother Amnon killed. The word comes back to David that he was going to kill all of his sons. And David just went crazy, was tearing his clothes, and, and he wept. Then he found out that it was just, just Amnon. And the other boys, we were crying, they were mourning, but Absalom had taken his revenge. And he knew that David would come after him, and David was very unhappy, and he mourned the loss of Absalom. He lost his oldest son! It can't get any worse. And Absalom runs away. And he goes to a place called Geshur, and he lives there for about, about three years. He has no contact with David. And David is mourning because he wants Absalom back. He's, he's mourning over Amnon, and he wants Absalom back at the same time. It can't get any worse. And then David decides that he's going to bring him back. He's going to bring him back and to Jerusalem. And so he says, Absalom, I want you to come home. But when you come home, you're not going to see my face. I don't know why he did that, but he, he had no contact with Absalom. But he had hope. And he brought Absalom back. At least he knew he was in town. And Absalom began to build a conspiracy against David. He would sit at the front gate of the city and say, tell me about your problems. And the people would tell him, and he said, well, this is what I would do if I was king, but David's not around, is he? Nobody ever sees David, but I'm here to, to help you. I'm here to give you advice. And he started to win over the people, and the people started liking Absalom. And Absalom planned to take the throne. And so it's been a couple of years now, Dave, Absalom does this, and he says to David, listen, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a group out to Hebron, which is where you were anointed king, and I'm just going to have a, 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 a party, so to speak, a worship experience. We're going to sacrifice to the Lord. So he took 200 men out there. But the, his purpose was to plan to take the throne. And he goes to Hebron, and he unleashes it then. And people all over said, now we're going to make Absalom king. And he had won them over. 
And word gets back to David that Absalom was going to take the throne. And he thought, he had thought, well, you know, maybe Absalom and I can kind of rule together. But no, Absalom wanted to be king. And David was fearful. His son, his daughter who was destroyed, his son that was killed, his baby that was lost, his son that killed his brother, his son that now was trying to take his kingdom. And now even this, when he comes back to Jerusalem, he's going to take David's life. It can't get any worse. And so David says, we've got to go. We've got to leave. And he gathers his family and and certain advisors, and everybody turned against him, by the way, military leaders, some of his strongest counselors, some of his closest friends, a lot of the people. And so David gets a group of several hundred people and said, we've got to leave Jerusalem. And under the cover of darkness, he leaves his throne. And once again, David says, it can't get any worse. My own son is trying to take my throne and take my life at the same time. And so David, who was one of the most famous men in all the world, in all the world, David David is now walking away. And the Bible says that he went out of Jerusalem and crossed the, the, the Kidron Valley in the middle of the night and he's going up the Mount of Olives and the Bible says that he's barefooted he's got I guess in mourning said he has a cloak on you wouldn't recognize him it was just a plain old robe that he had and his head was uncovered and the picture is his head was down and he just discouraging leaving his throne because his son is going to seek to kill him. It can't get any worse. Now, ladies and gentlemen, God gives us the Word of God to teach us, and across the centuries, He gives us counsel. And David goes and he gets out of town, and the Bible says that he's headed toward the wilderness. And he stops and they camp out. Maybe it's a cave, a campsite, I don't know. And he gets up in the morning and he writes Psalm 3. I want you to hear that and uh, to, to, to hear that, what he says that morning. Oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul there is no deliverance for him in God. They're saying that God has left him. The Lord is, no longer has his hand on him. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. Here's what's amazing. He had a good night's sleep. Even when it can't get any worse, he had a good night's sleep. Because even then, his eyes were still on the Lord. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. And he says on that morning, after all of these bad things over years have happened, he says, I woke for the Lord to sustain me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. By the way, that's not happened yet. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. On that morning, David believes that God is going to restore the kingdom and give to him another 
chance. Folks, this is a word that is written for you and written for me. It is, as I have titled it, it is a response to the phrase, it can't get any worse. And when you look at the history, you look at what's happened in David's life, boy, all of a sudden Psalm 3 becomes a completely different picture. It has more power and it has more focus and it has greater guidance than we could have ever imagined. Several things I want you to see here quickly. First of all, I want you to see the position of our adversaries. David says right there how my adversaries have increased. And he talks about the enemies. Let me tell you, there are three major enemies that you have in your life right now. You have the enemy that is uh, around you. And uh, that, that's the world. That's the culture in which we live. That is an external uh, enemy that is outside your heart and life. It's circumstances. It's people. It's situations it's in environments but that is your enemy and it will seek to destroy you but not only do you have the external enemy the one that is around you but you have the enemy that is within you that enemy is your flesh David knew what that was like he made a lot of mistakes that's an internal enemy you can't ever get away from it I can't get away from it there are things in my life I can't believe that I have those thoughts and attitudes and actions because that's the enemy that is within me. But also, not only do you have an enemy around you that is external, not only do you have an enemy that is within you that is internal, but you've got an enemy that's below you. And that's an enemy that is eternal. And that's the devil himself who would seek to bring you down, is focused on you right now to seek to trip you up. No matter who you are, what you are, no matter what your circumstances, they are right there. And so David talks about his enemies. Oh, Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him and God. But even then, even after all this has happened, David has an advocate. And the message here is this. In Jesus Christ, we have an advocate. You are not alone. And David says clearly what this advocate do, will do for us. He says there, but you, O Lord, and he says three things there. He said, you are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. He said, first of all, you're my shield. That's kind of defense for the defenseless. You're my shield. When we think of a shield, what do we think about? You've seen a shield. We have one. I could have gone up there in our prop area where the Roman soldiers have a shield. And, and you've seen in hundreds of movies uh, where they carry the shield. And usually it's a uh, uh, normally, it's on their left hand, and it, it shields them from the, from the arrows, from the swords, from the, from the sword that comes against them. And you say, Lord, you are my shield. Boy, you ought to feel good about that. Well, listen, I've got some great news for you. It's stronger than that. You know what this shield is? What, the, what shield means? Here's an accurate, accurate translation of the word shield. Iron Man. That's what it is. That's what the picture is. It's the picture you see in the movie. Iron Man. He is covered from the soles of his feet to the top of his head with a shield and nothing can hurt him. Nothing can hurt him. That's the shield that David has. That's what the word literally means. It's a shield that encompasses every part of you. And when the enemy comes against you, you have no vulnerability. So David says, Lord, you are my shield. And then he says, you are my glory. He's not talking about 
Um, he's, he's not talking about all that he has done because he knew that he'd done so many things wrong. But he's talking about, he's talking about that my, the glory, God, that you have, you have shared with me because your hand is on me. You don't deserve this. I don't deserve it. But that's what God did for us. And so not, our, not only are we surrounded <clears throat> by the shield that is there, but we have the glory of God. I guess the best way to describe it is like being in the, in the cloud, that once again you are surrounded by the glory of God. And when you belong to him, when you have a relationship, not just when you say, well, I believe in God and the, and the man upstairs will take care of me, but when you share in the glory of God. Folks, listen. What that, a, a good colloquial meaning of that is when somebody messes with you, they mess with him. Because you belong to him. And David, even with all of this stuff, even when so many times he's saying, it can't get any worse, God is still his glory. And then he says, he says, and the one who lifts my head. If you look in 2 Samuel chapter 15, you'll see the verse there where he leaves Jerusalem. And he goes out and where I told you a moment ago that this is what he's referring to when he's walking up that hill. This is the king. This is the king, usually in an ornate robe, surrounded by his servants, surrounded by the pomp and the circumstance and the wealth. And he walks up that hill. He walks up that hill barefooted with a, with a covering that, it, that anybody could have worn. And he walks up there with his head down. And, he, and he, he needs someone to lift his head. And that's exactly what God does. That's exactly what the Lord wants to do in your my life, in my life. He said, I was crying to the Lord with my voice. And he answered me from his holy mountain. And then he, they stopped and he lay down and he slept. And somehow God moved in his life. And I awoke for the Lord sustains me. Now listen to me. The bad stuff wasn't over. You say, well, that's really good. Well, no, not really. Because you know what happened after that? As David is walking up that hill, as he looks, gets up the next morning, David knows God's going to give me the kingdom back, but it's not going to be without a fight. I must go to war with my own son. I've got to go back and Find out who's with me and who isn't. I've got to rebuild the kingdom. And then something he did not know. In the midst of the battle, Absalom was killed. He lost his son. And David says he mourns and he weeps because even though Absalom wanted to kill him, he loved his son. Once again, it can't get any worse. David says, oh, Absalom, Absalom, he cries out. If, if it had just been me instead of you, he would have gladly given up his life for his son. But everything has gone wrong. But David knows that God is going to be faithful. And he says that right there. He said, I won't be afraid of 10,000s of people. Let me tell you, that's pretty amazing because we live with fear all the time. Watch the news. Look at your life, where you work, and what happens to your friends. Some of you, you're, you're dealing with, man, the situations in your family, in your work, in your health. You've had friends, associates go against you and, and er, downtrodden. And it can't get any worse. And he 
He says, Arise, O Lord, save me. O my God, for you have spitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. It is like God has taken on the wild animals that would seek to destroy him and broke their teeth so that they could no longer harm him. And David realizes here in Psalm 3, he says, The Lord is when they save me, O oh my God. For you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. And then here's a key. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. That is, those who belong to him. The words there in verse 7, the word save, and the word salvation in verse 8, come from the same root word. The Hebrew word is the word Yeshua. And it's from that word that we get the name Jesus. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our shield. As a follower of Christ, Jesus is a part, is a, has the glory of God. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus lifts our head. If you're not at the spot today where you would say it can't get any worse, you will be. Or you certainly know someone who is in that spot right now. And God gives to you an opportunity. This is so much more than you just ought to trust God. It's so much more than you ought to believe in Him. Because the importance, folks, is to see what God has for you. Because it can't get any worse, God sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, and to die on the cross for your sin. So you might have the opportunity of the moment. This is not about being religious. This is about accepting Christ as your Savior. You may have been a churchwoman, a churchman, or a churchwoman all of your life. Be young or old. You could have all types of experiences. But the only thing that counts is knowing Jesus. Accepting him as your Savior. You see, what happens here is that, that David has, uh, through the authority of God, he's got his courage back. David has got his confidence back. And David even has, at that point, his contentment. Doesn't mean everything's going fine because all those things are still happening. There are still challenges that are there. But he's rooted in that with his courage, with his confidence, with his contentment. And the Lord offers that to you today. You're here for a purpose. You're here with an opportunity. For some of you, there are those here, it is to, the opportunity to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. This is not a religious game. David had no hope, but on that morning, and that's what it says in the scripture, it talks about a psalm of David when he fled from, fled from Absalom. It was a morning prayer. It was a morning prayer. And God gives to you that opportunity to know him as Savior, 
God takes you where you are. There are those of you here today that need to know Jesus as your Savior. There are those of you here today that are Christians. You're a follower of Christ, and you need a, a church home. You need to be with a body of believers. Boy, I'm telling you, David needed to be around some folks who were with him in this. Or perhaps you're a believer today, and God wants you to take the next step. It's a trial. It's a challenge. It's all of these things. It's there for you. Like that morning, this is a moment that God gives to you. It makes a difference, literally, in your eternity. It is the only thing out there that makes a difference. And it either has come or it will come. When there are the words, it can't get any worse. Well, it can't get any better than the fact that God reaches out to you and loves you and cares for you and sent his son for you. Father, as we come before you today, we have seen once again how you can take part of the word that you inspired and that, Lord, without looking at the history, it it's encouraging, and but there are a lot of other psalms like that and verses that say you trust God. But Lord, you confirm that to us in David's life. Lord, I pray that you have gotten our attention. I pray for the lives of those here who do not know Christ as their Savior. Maybe good people, but they can't do it alone. I pray for those that would give their heart and life to Jesus today. Lord, we pray that you would move in these moments for those that need to make those decisions and that they might come to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.